Hey, I'm Mark Hennings, one of the founders of EntryPoint AI, and today I'm excited to talk to you about Low Rank Adaptation, or LoRa, which is a parameter-efficient fine-tuning method for large language models. And we're also going to talk about QLoRa, which I would consider LoRa 2.0. So to understand the need for an efficient way to fine-tune large language models, First, we have to look at where you use fine tuning in the training process. So the first part of creating a large language model is pre-training. Pre-training is when we take a very large amount of text, like 2 trillion tokens, which would be equivalent to roughly 1.5 trillion words. And the model just goes through all this text and learn, learns to predict the next word based on um, the context of the text. Pretty much everything after that is fine tuning. So once we have a base model that's been trained on a lot of text, we do fine tuning. We often do instruct tuning. This is how we get super fun chat models like ChatGPT. And then after instruct tuning, there's safety tuning. And safety tuning tries to prevent the model from doing things that you don't want it to do. And from there, we can further take these models and fine tune them more to do very specific tasks super well. And there's just a ton of potential ways to do that. You can also do domain fine tuning. This would be taking the base model and then teaching it to be better at something like law or finance. So as you can see, the possibilities for fine tuning are unlimited. So let's look at how full parameter fine tuning works. It updates all the model weights. So that's all the parameters, right? And these are very large matrices of numbers. So a 7 billion parameter model has 7 billion weights. 13 billion has 13 billion and so on. So that's a lot of numbers. And um, all these numbers get updated repeatedly. So it could go through your training data like five times, and that would be five epochs. Storing and updating all those weights takes a ton of memory. And that limits full parameter fine tuning to only very large GPUs or GPU clusters. If we're constrained by hardware, then we can't test all these different paths to take our base model. So LoRa attempts to solve this problem in two key ways. First, instead of updating the weights of the model, like all 7 billion weights directly, we track the changes we want to make to those weights. So isn't that just adding more information that you need to store in memory? Well, yes, but there's a huge benefit to doing this. And this is where the core of LoRa kicks into play, which is that the changes you're tracking to your model weights are actually tracked in two smaller separate matrices. They get multiplied together to form a matrix the size of the layer that you're fine tuning. Let's visualize this. Um, first of all, these tracked changes, you have a matrix of track changes the same size as the model's weight matrix, and you can simply add them together. So every square gets added to the corresponding square, and you get a fine-tuned matrix out that has your changes added to it. It's a very simple addition. Now, this matrix that you're adding with your weight changes is actually calculated when you need it by multiplying the two smaller matrices. This is called matrix decomposition. When you take a matrix and then you have two smaller matrices, you can multiply to try to get the same numbers back. In this case, these are very small matrices. They're only one row or column deep. So that's called rank one. And in this case, the rank one matrices, there's a total of five numbers in them, in each one. So that's 10 basically parameters that you're multiplying together to get a 25 parameter, like a five by five matrix here you're sort of sacrificing some of the precision in your final table when you're working with these two smaller matrices in order to get a huge benefit in efficiency. Because 10 trainable parameters here versus 25 is a pretty good savings, but the savings increase as your rank stays fixed and your tables that you're working with get much, much bigger, like the size of the models we're talking about. Here is an example, if you increase the rank to rank two, this is what it looks like. You've got these two matrices that are two values deep, and you'll get a higher precision output from that. So we can change rank for our LoRa fine-tuning jobs. We can decide how precise we want our final output table to be. 
And as that output table gets bigger, we can see that you're training a lot more parameters as rank increases. But even when rank is 512 for a 7 billion parameter model, you're only fine tuning 86 million parameters. And 512 would be considered a very high rank. In percentage terms, it's just kind of insane. For a rank of one, it doesn't even show up in two decimal places for these models of how many parameters you're working with. For rank of 16, it's like 0 0.04. And as the model gets bigger, you can see like 0.01%. Now I am making an assumption here, which is that this would be one giant matrix, which isn't actually true because a model has multiple layers. And so those like 180 billion parameters are split across multiple matrices. But this illustrates the point that as the model gets bigger, the rank is training a smaller percentage of the actual parameters. And you can increase rank to train like a larger percent of parameters of the original model. Now, the terminology gets really confusing here because we're talking about trainable parameters. Those are the two smaller LoRa matrices. But remember, they always get multiplied together to form a matrix the same size as the one of the model that gets added to it. So you're always still training all of the model's parameters. You're just working with a smaller set of them. So naturally at this point, if you're like me, you're asking, well, what should I set rank to? Like, what's the right value of rank? Um, am I gonna be making a big compromise with LoRa if I set rank too low? And the theory is that for most tasks, it may not matter. Downstream tasks for large language models, so if they've been trained on a ton of information and they have all these parameters, they're sort of like bigger than they need to be. And your specific task that you wanna fine tune it for is a subset of everything it could do before like with prompt engineering, perhaps, like it's, it's been exposed to a lot of these things and it has prior knowledge of them, you can get away with really rough updates. And they, they test this in the paper and they get really good results. Otherwise we probably wouldn't be talking about LoRa, right? Now there are areas where higher rank could help. So teaching complex behavior and then also teaching behavior that contradicts or falls outside the scope of the original training of the model. An example of that might be if you have a chat model like Llama 2 Chat that was fine tuned to be really safe and so it won't respond to questions about diet and health. But now you want to create like a fitness or a nutrition advice bot. You've got your work cut out for you with fine tuning a model that's already been trained to do the opposite. So having higher rank in that case might be beneficial. But that's not where the story about rank ends. And to get to the end, we first have to look at QLoRa. QLoRa is this quantized version of LoRa, which means that it takes these precise parameters, like um, their 16-bit floats, for example, which is a long decimal number, it's very precise. Um, it takes 16 bits in memory. And then quantization reduces that into something like a four-bit number. Now, I had this misconception that because it's gonna be quantized, that you would somehow lose some precision. Well, the way they've implemented QLoRa is that you can recover the original precision of the model. So they came up with this clever way to compress the size of the model and then recover the original size, which sounds impossible, but they exploit this fact that all of these parameters fall into essentially like a normal distribution. Think of a bell curve. And if you use the four bits that you're compressing it to, to just tell it where that number falls on the curve for this particular data set, then you can actually reduce the size to four bits and then recover the precision at the end. So you just make it smaller while you're fine tuning it and then you get back everything you ever wanted at the end. So I think QLoRa is LoRa 2.0. I think it's, it's a great method and it uses even less memory than LoRa, significantly less. And in the paper, there's two other things I wanna call out that are super helpful for using LoRa in practice. The first is that training all the layers of the network is essential to match performance of full parameter fine tuning. In the paper, they basically say they can't reproduce the quality of full parameter fine tuning unless they train all the layers of the network. Second, rank may not matter in the range of eight to 256. So let's look at the actual paper here. In the paper body, they say that the most critical LoRa hyperparameter is how many LoRa adapters are used in total. That means how many layers of the network you're training. 
and that LoRa on all linear transformer block layers, all the layers, are required to match full fine-tuning performance. And then other LoRa hyperparameters, such as the projection dimension R, that's rank, do not affect performance. That's crazy, okay? But here they show we find LoRa R is unrelated to final performance if LoRa is used on all layers. So in this little chart here, they show LoRa R going from 8 to 16 to 32 to 64. And then on this benchmark, uh, Rouge L, basically it's not changing the performance in any statistically significant way. Now they only tested rank in the range of 8 to 256. So we really can't make assertions outside of that range. But if you're in that range, you might be good. However, they set rank to 64. Even though they say it doesn't matter, in the end they chose 64 for the rank. Don't know what to think about that, but maybe 64 is a good uh, starting point to use. And then they chose alpha of 16. So let's talk about these other hyperparameters. Okay, we already covered rank, and in the Microsoft LoRa repository they used 8 and 16. That was released in 2021. In the QLoRa paper they went with 64, and then this hyperparameter alpha. This is a strange one, okay? I'm not gonna sugarcoat this. This is a weird hyperparameter. What it does is it determines a scaling factor that's applied to your weight changes before they get added into the original model weights. So like multiplying by two makes them double in value and then you add that, or you could like divide them by two, make them half their original value and add that. So you're like having a less of an impact on the original model, but it's determined as alpha divided by rank. So you have to like do this math ahead of time to figure out what your scale factor is going to be. Um, in the Microsoft LoRa repository, they set alpha to two times the rank. So then your training would have a 2x impact. QLoRa went with alpha 16, rank of 64. 16 divided by 64 is one fourth. So then their training is having like 25% of impact when it's finally added back in. And I just found that really surprising. And I'm also just really surprised that you have to, that you interact with the LoRa hyperparameters in this way. Um, I think you should just be able to set a scale factor, right? Like I want this to be two X or like one half instead of having to do um, alpha divided by rank. But I didn't create LoRa, so that's the way it is. And now you know how to use it. One possible explanation for why they set these like 2x and 1 4th scaling factors using alpha is that you can think of it as partially redundant with learning rate. If you're increasing learning rate and you're increasing the scale factor, you're having an amplified impact. Um, so they recommend just leaving alpha fixed and playing with learning rate to keep it simpler. However, based on my understanding, I still think they're a little bit different um, and worth looking at separately. So uh, I suppose we'll learn more about these hyperparameters in time. And then the last hyperparameter for LoRa that we need to look at is dropout. Dropout is this percentage that will randomly set some of the parameters to zero. It can help avoid overfitting, which is when the model has learned your training data so well that it can only answer your training data and it performs really poorly on data that it hasn't seen. And for setting dropout in the QLoRa paper, they went with 0.1 or 10% for the 7 billion and 13 billion sized models. And then 0.05 or 5% for the larger 33 billion and 65 billion parameter models. And they also included some of their other hyperparameters like learning rate and batch size in the paper in this chart. And I just think it's really interesting to look at this stuff because there's no hard and fast rules for it. So you really just have to find out what other people are getting good results with under what situations, and then go from there and make any adjustments for your own data. So that's Laura. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something. Um, I'd love it if you check out EntryPoint. We do have integrations that feature Laura fine tuning, such as with Replicate or Gradient. And you can get started really easily and put Laura into practice without having to write a single line of code. Just a few clicks, upload your training data, and go. Cheers.